Welcome to Fuzzy Butts and Friends. Well, as much as it drives fuzzy butts all over this place, absolutely crazy whenever they hear me say it. I am the host of the show, your big dog, Luke Robinson, coming back at you again this week. Also back with us again is our co-host and co-producer, Ginger Morgan. She's the executive producer, uh, executive director. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Whoops, that was a slip. She's the executive director the of, the Puppy Up, <laughs> of the Puppy Up Foundation. Ginger, how are you? I'm doing well. I'm really excited to hear about what we're going to talk about today about dental health. I, I am I am too, and we have a wonderful expert from Colorado State University, which uh, we have a lot of history there and fond memories, well, to the extent that we can, and it's a wonderful institution. Um, and on that note, as you know, you know, it's I think I take pretty good care of my fuzzy butts, but if I had to put the top three things that I'm absolutely horrible at, dental care would be in the top three. And in here today in this episode to talk to us about dental care in our canine and feline companions is Dr. Naomi Hoyer. She's with Colorado State uh, University. Uh, Dr. Hoyer, uh, hello and welcome to Fuzzy Butts and Friends. Hello. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Thank you for, for being here with us. How is, uh, how is the weather there in Colorado in Fort Collins? Is it pretty brutal? Well, you know, actually, so right now it's sunny and 50 degrees. About two hours ago, it was snowing. So I feel like a standard Colorado day. <laughs> Absolutely. I miss Colorado. Well, we like to start this show, Dr. Hoyer. Have a little bit of fun before we get to business uh, and uh, talking about your origin story and your fuzzy butts. So tell us, do you have any fuzzy butts uh, not necessarily with you in your house? Yes, I do. So I have a lot, some fuzzy, some not so fuzzy uh, patients in my house. So I have two dogs. We have a Dalmatian and a French bulldog. And then we have a cat um, who has joined our house just a year ago. And it's been a long time since we had a cat. So we have had to transition back into having a pet who can jump on the counters. And then we have five <laughs> chickens who are very fuzzy. They live outside. And then one tortoise who is our non-fuzzy. So. <laughs> yes, it would hard to put. Be very difficult to put the tortoise in the fuzzy butt category. Correct. I would, I would yeah. say. Well, you've got a, you've got a full. It sounds in happy household. So cheers, cheers to that. I gotta say, I love Frenchies. I love, I love fuzzy butts and and the non fuzzy yeah. butt sort of all kinds. But uh, I on Twitter, I'm, I'm a part of the. Somehow, I'm, I'm, I'm a part of the all the Frenchie groups, and they got they yeah. post some of the cutest pictures. I think on on uh, social media. Yeah, we've had French bulldogs in our family for a long time, and I it would be hard. I would hard be hard for me to imagine my life without one. I just love them so much. You, you love Frenchies, that's your breed. Well, Great Pyrenees are mine, and Ginger's the. She loves everything of all shapes and colors. Um, yep. what, what is what is your uh, Frenchie's name and your Dalmatian's name? So my Dalmatian's name is Chowder. We have a food theme in our house, and the Frenchie is Puddin. 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 <laughs> Puddin. Yeah. And what's the cat? The cat is um bunny which doesn't fit quite as much with the food theme although people do eat rabbits so we've squeezed the name and he just bounces around a lot so great well you sound like you're a lover of fuzzy butts so is that how you got your start in the veterinary medicine yeah i like many people who are in veterinary medicine i knew when i was nine years old when i read james harriet's book all creatures great and small that mm -hmm. i wanted to be a vet and i have known ever since and so i went to college knowing i was going to be a vet i graduated from veterinary school actually 20 years ago in 2002 um, started out in mixed animal practice um, spent 10 years as a general practitioner before going to complete my specialty and now i'm here as a dentist and oral surgeon so why dentistry and oral surgery why that choice? Um, you know, I just love the teeth and the mouth. And I think as a general practitioner in 10 years, when I was looking at, you know, what is the the next stage of my career looks like, dentistry is the only thing I could have imagined doing all day, every day. Um, the thing that I love about it the most, I think, is that it is probably the most under-recognized area of disease in the patient. Um, and we stand to do the most good because so many patients are living with sort of subclinical discomfort and pain. Um, we can find cancer when it's early enough to fix it by doing good dentistry. We can take away tooth root abscesses. We can diagnose all kinds of diseases. So for me, people say the eyes are the window to soul. It's really the mouth. Wow. That's quite fascinating. I'll have to think about that one. But but we do do know, I was listening to a podcast recently, and the, the host uh, himself had dental issues and that he was just not doing a very good job of, of managing 
uh, his his teeth and his oral hygiene. And what he found is that he actually had a low grade persistent infection that was causing and, and could cause potentially a whole host of other problems. So we do know that dental hygiene is linked to a whole host of other problems. Is that right? Yeah, tremendously true. So it, it is in link to heart disease, just like you hear of people having infections in their mouth that can go to their heart. Um, there's some correlation between chronic inflammation and kidney disease. Wow. Um, and certainly just like that low grade pain that our animals sometimes tolerate because they don't have great ways of telling us that they're hurting. You know, we can't even tell you how many times I've taken away a painful tooth. The owner would have told me up and down and sideways that their pet was in no way in pain. And then they tell me after I take it away that my dog is like a whole new dog. Yeah, and that's tough, too, because I know, uh, I'm not sure how much uh, you know about the Puppy Up Foundation, but our focus is uh, comparative oncology and cancer um, and companion animals. And and so what I've learned over the years being doing this almost 15 years, actually 15 years this year, is that uh, uh, companion animals have different thresholds of pain. And uh, so you can't wait until uh, uh, your dog or your cat says, hey, uh, something's not right. I feel uncomfortable. So you, that right there is make, you make a wonderful case for um, why you have to go see uh, your, you have to get your dog's teeth and oral cavity checked out um, every year. Before we jump into all that, because we have a lot to cover today. <laughs> That's a big <laughs> list. <laughs> <laughs> we'll make it nice and easy. But one of the things, Dr. Horrier, I found out and discovered in doing due diligence for this podcast uh, again, going back to the fact that we do uh, mostly cancer stuff uh, with our foundation is that we all talk about comparative oncology and one cancer because science has taught us that dogs are a wonderful model uh, for understanding cancer and people. Not so much uh, that's true with, with cats, but dogs certainly. And in doing research, I learned that the same is true in your field because comparative on uh, odontology is a real thing. So tell us about that. It's very exciting. Well, I think most people don't actually know that most of the work done in humans, so the the big area, so we actually oral tumors, oral <laughs> cancer is something that we deal with a lot. So the same thing is true with dog studies of oral cancer. So squamous cell carcinoma, which is one of the most common human aggressive oral cancers we actually see in dogs. And a lot of the work on how to treat that was done in dogs. Um, but also periodontal disease, which is the most common disease. So periodontal disease is disease around the tooth. It starts with gingivitis. So that red bleeding gums that you get when you don't floss every day like you're supposed to. Dogs, most of them are not brushing and flossing every day. So say they get periodontal disease in the same way that people do. And the vast majority of research done on how to treat and try to slow the progression of periodontal disease in humans was actually done on beagles first. Um, so when you think about putting in implants or putting crowns on teeth or doing root canals, a lot of that was actually really um, hammered down in dogs. So dogs have been a really great resource for understanding those diseases in people. And then now it's kind of a, yeah, we learn things from people that we take to the dog world and we take things from dog world and take it into humans. But is it, is it similar to uh, comparative oncology and that the dog is the much better model than the cat? Not as much. Is that also correct? I would say there are ways in which cats, um, so I would say the, the place where cats and the way that they manifest oral disease can be similar to humans is cats with immunosuppressive diseases. So cats have a disease called feline um, immunodeficiency virus, which is actually very similar to human immunodeficiency virus or HIV. And so understanding the way that that virus affects cats and some of their systems actually is pretty applicable to humans. But the way that cats experience oral cancer, yeah, for sure, that that does not seem to correlate really strongly with human models. What about um, the overall dental disease and the structure of the feline uh, oral cavity? Is, is that similar to, uh, I guess that was my question, is how similar is feline dentistry to canine dentistry and to human dentistry? It's similar. So we know that with most of our species who are at least partially carnivorous, so the way that teeth are developed and formed are actually very similar in cats, in dogs, and humans. They're very, very different when you get into species herbivores. So horses, rabbits, species that have teeth that grow continuously, whereas dogs, cats, and people all have teeth. They have a baby, a set of baby teeth that they grow and then they lose, and then they have another set of adult teeth that grow into maturity and then last their whole life. Um, so that actually, the developmental dentistry piece of it is actually very similar in both. The diseases that they get, dogs are often more similar to the humans and the diseases they get that affect the oral cavity than cats, which have kind of their own group of diseases, which is typically true of cats. They like to do things their own way. Okay. Well, that's why I broke them out separately in the the, the, the talking points. So let's yeah. break them down individually. Let's start off 
with our canine companions, uh, since I know them a little bit better uh, than our feline ones. Uh, talk to us about dental disease in dogs. What are the main main diseases that we need to be thinking about? Yeah, so I would say <clears throat> the number one disease in dogs and people, and actually the the most common disease that dogs get period, hands down, above liver disease or cancer or anything else, is periodontal disease. So that disease around the structures of the tooth themselves. So more than 80% of dogs in the course of their lifetime will have some degree of periodontal disease. Um, so that's number one. And the way that that shows up in our dogs is that they get gingivitis. Sometimes they get bad breath. It can progress to bone loss. They can lose teeth. We, we actually see dogs here at CSU regularly, regularly who come in because their jaws have been broken because they've lost so much bone. So periodontal disease can be very very devastating in our canine patients. And then uh, I would say then, go ahead. No, please go ahead. That, that covers the number one disease. Let's go yeah, ahead. so number one, I would say number two is endodontic disease. So periodontal disease is disease around the tooth. Endodontic disease is actually disease inside the tooth. And in our dog patients, in people, it's usually cavities because we eat too much sugar. In dogs, it's actually broken teeth from chewing on things that don't belong in their mouth. Um, and so sometimes just because maybe we don't know better because our dogs do things out in the backyard that they're not supposed to do. Dogs chew on things that are too hard. They break their teeth and then they kill the inside of the tooth and get disease up inside that tooth that can lead to abscesses, lead to really severe pain. Um, and that's probably the second most common one that we see. What are uh, just some, just a couple of questions off the top of my head. Um, what are the, the surfaces or the materials that, that dogs should absolutely not put in their mouths because of the risk of break? So I would say this is actually a pretty hard question to answer. So the general rule that I tell people is if you can't indent whatever you're trying to have your dog chew on with your thumbnail, or the slightly more funny way that I talk to people about it is if somebody chuck that at your kneecap and you want to move out of the way, your dog probably shouldn't be chewing on it. Now, the follow-up question that I usually get from most people is, my dog needs to chew on fill in the blank because otherwise, you know, their mental health isn't good or I think it's natural. Um, and I, I think those are good reasons, but you just have to know then that you're putting their teeth at risk. So if the most important thing for you is keeping their teeth intact, then we want to keep those really hard structures out of their mouth. The worst offender is elk antlers. So those got to be popular in um, lots of sort of natural food stores recently. Elk antlers are just about the worst thing because the wow. animal that should be chewing on an elk antler is actually a rodent. Like you don't see pictures in the wild of wolves carrying elk antlers around because they're meant to be chewed on by animals that have teeth that continuously grow as a way to sort of wear down their incisors. They're not actually a chew toy for dogs. Wow. Uh, that, I was just going to ask about the antlers. Now, yeah. are there other antlers that are okay besides the elk? None of the okay. Nope. None of the antlers. The material is just too hard. It doesn't belong in a dog's mouth. And the hard thing about that, so if a dog breaks a tooth and most of the tooth is intact, we can still save that tooth. We can do a root canal on it, just like you have a root canal done on your tooth. The problem with Ouch. elk antlers, <laughs> yeah, exactly. The, the good thing is that our patients are asleep, so they don't feel it. So they have a much more positive response to root canals than people do because you feel all the little, you know, filing inside your tooth. The problem with antlers, any of the antlers in dog's teeth is that they don't just break teeth, they like explode them. Um, so by the time they're broken on an ant, you're, usually all we can do is take the tooth out. Wow. So I, I love that, uh, that you said that that rule of thumb, literally, of thumb. that, that yeah. you, so you have to be able to depress it with your thumbnail. Yeah. I love that great rule of thumb. And, uh, but my question is then, because you also see in, in addition to uh, elk antlers or elder, antlers of any elk, um, are, are dog bones or are, are not dog bones or actual bones like cow bones, those thick. And my, my guess is um, I don't think you can actually depress them with your thumbnail. And those are very, very popular and sometimes filled very with popular. they have fillings in them. So but those are not yeah. good. I, if it's, the problem is you won't know. So sometimes people will say, you know, oh, my dog has been chewing on this their whole life and they've never broken a tooth. And then my answer is you're lucky. It's just <laughs> like my mom and the dentist, right? Like my mom has gone to the dentist every year and every year the dentist is like, please don't chew on ice. You're going to break a tooth. Please don't chew on ice. You're going to break a tooth. And then sure enough, one year she broke. So you're not going to know that your dog's tooth isn't strong enough to handle that until it's too late, until it's broken the tooth. So I don't recommend dogs chewing on big, hard femur bones and things like that. Uh, treats that soften, so like bully sticks or, you know, there's all kinds of animal products that you can get. Those are okay because they get softer as the dog chews on them. The ones we want to be careful about are the ones that stay really, really hard. 
Um, excellent. What about you mentioned in the backyard when you have when, when, well when your kid puts whatever they in their mouth that they shouldn't put in their mouth. Yeah. What are some preventative measures measures that you can take? Because I've 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 actually done this with my kids. I actually had a poop eater. Uh, one of my Pyrenees, God bless him, he was a rescue, yeah. and uh, that's just how I, uh, corporophagia, I guess, is how he well, how he survived. I think. And but I, I but uh, I just wanted I always wanted to find a way to discourage him for doing that. And the one remedy that I I I, I did to no success, but I but you hear a lot is like capsaicin. Like get like liquid capsaicin. So how is there any way that you can prevent or discourage uh, dogs from chewing on things? Well, I would say the the better thing is no, because chewing is really natural behavior for dogs, right? And so it's not a behavior that we're ever going to train out of them because it is something very natural. I would love to just have people move into chews that are better for the teeth. And so um, Kongs can be really beneficial. There's actually a product called Go Nuts, which is a very um, sort of a hard rubber that has different layers. So as the dog is moving its way through it, you can see like, okay, my dog's getting to the point where this chew needs to be gotten rid of. There are... Um, What's Raw the name of that? Go nuts, like donuts with okay. a chain. Yeah, so I think it's G-O-N-U-T-S. Um, so that's one I recommend, especially for my really hard chewing dogs, like the big shepherds, dogs who like really need to get something you know, sink their teeth into something. And then again, if you're going to make the decision, you know what, like I hear what Dr. Hoyer says, and I respectfully disagree with her because my dog's mental health is really related to him chewing on this very hard structure. Just make sure somebody's looking in there really regularly to make sure that there are, if there are teeth that are breaking, that we're dealing with those before they become a big problem. That's good advice. So, so your advice then is, is you don't necessarily have to discourage them. Just don't have them around, but, and more importantly, have <laughs> much softer alternatives readily yeah. available. So they just choose those. instead. Yeah. I think that's wonderful advice. I just want to, to reiterate that and make sure I yeah. had to clear my head. So um, what do you, that's great recommendations about choose, but what do you recommend over to, to pet parents when you speak to them or when you teach your students? What Walk us through dental care. And yeah. So the best, the best preventative care for your dog's dental health. So if you are truly trying to prevent the onset of periodontal disease, which is what we're all trying to do when we brush our teeth every day is the same thing for us, which is daily toothbrushing. And so one thing that I teach students a lot, because I'm not in the position anymore as a specialist of seeing pets when they come in as puppies is just as much as you talk about getting puppies their vaccines and getting them used to having their nails trimmed like that is the age where we want to be introducing toothbrushing because if you don't introduce it until they're an adult dog number one it truly is harder to teach old dogs new things <laughs> and number two we may already have periodontal disease that has started and then it is we are absolutely trying to shut the barn door after the horse has run out so getting good preventative care started really early in the pet's life is actually the best thing. Now, if you can't, because some people just, you know, they have physical challenges, so they can't brush their pet's teeth, or they have a dog who just won't allow it. You know, we see rescue dogs who come in and just have that really, really, really sensitive mouth. They're never going to let somebody brush. It's just not something that was going to be a part of their life or every chihuahua. And I love them dearly, but I don't know many people who can brush their chihuahua's teeth. <laughs> there are actually some good alternatives. And sort of the next best thing after brushing is dental specific treats and chews and dental diets. And the reason that those are better than oral rinses or water additives is because you're still doing something that physically removes that soft plaque that you have on teeth, because that is really the thing that triggers the onset of periodontal disease. Um, so I would say brushing is best, and then next best is dental treats and chews, and there's a great website where you can look up recommended products. Um, they do a really good job of testing products to make sure they're effective, um, but then also making sure that they're not going to hurt teeth, which is good. What's that website? We'll put it up in our show notes. Yeah, the website is called VOHC, Veterinary Oral Health Council, is what it stands for, .org. Wonderful. Thank you for that link. Um, can you walk us through some of the uh, brand names uh, yeah. that are out there that you think are suitable for our canine companions? Yeah, so I would say my favorite, probably my favorite dental chews are made by a company called Verbac. Um, they, the chew name is CET Chews, and they come in a whole different variety of chews. So they have um, Hexident, um, they have Veggie Dent, which is actually what my dog needs because he's on a prescription diet. He can't have any kind of meat protein. Um, and so I love that they have kind of branched out and made a product that's a little bit more available. Um, there are uh, Greenies are actually a really good one. You'll see Greenies in pet stores. Those are a very 
very effective product. Those have been good for a long time. Um, those There are Oravet chews, which are also really nice. And I think a lot of like, number one, I always tell people check the ingredients, right? Because if you have a dog that has dietary sensitivities or allergies, I don't want you feeding a whole slew of a product. And then the other thing that I learned the hard way with my own dog is the first time you give a treat, make sure they actually chew it and don't just swallow it whole. Because hmm. number one, it's not going to do any good. And number two, it could potentially cause a problem. So, yeah. And, and that's always been a concern of mine, the choking factor, because I I think all my Pyrenees were like food monsters. They just, yeah. you put a bowl of kibble and it's gone in, you know, three seconds. And yeah. so um, do you recommend uh, getting dental chews that are bigger than your dog's oral orifice to, to prevent that, minimize that risk? I, uh, it's a two-part answer, yes, but. So the yes is absolutely. So I typically say choose a size bigger, but then I have had, and again, I'm not picking on chihuahuas, but it's just the example that I have. I don't know if you're familiar with any of the dental diets, which I also think are a great way to help um, with preventative dental health, but one of them in particular made by Hills is called TD, and it's like a really big kibble size, and they have like the regular TD kibble size, and then they have a small breed T TD kibble. And I like using the big size because I think it encourages patients to actually bite into the kibble. I don't think the small one does as much, um, but I had a chihuahua swallow one of those whole and he was fine, but it just, you know, like sometimes bigger is not better. Yeah, we, years we ago, to... Go ahead. Uh, years ago, I had a pet gift shop and called Pete's Treats and my dog was Pete. And it was really funny because I sold greenies and he would, when people would come in, and he was a German Shepherd, Rottweiler mix, he would kind of herd them over to the greenies. And most people didn't pay any attention, but then one day this lady says, where does he want me to go? I said, just humor him. And she and he led her right over to the greenies. So she bought a couple for her dogs and one for him. It was really funny. I, I sold a lot of greenies because of yeah. him. <laughs> he was like, how about this product? Yeah. Exactly. Like, and I'll take one too. <laughs> yeah, exactly. One for me, I, one for you. <laughs> I just wanted to, to make a note that we need to be careful of picking on the Chihuahua because we don't want to be canceled by the Chihuahua people at all. I love, <laughs> I, I truly, I was actually just telling one of our students today that I, my favorite thing in the world is a very, very grumpy old Chihuahua. Like I, <laughs> ju I feel like they're my spirit animal. So I, I understand. I, I completely I love understand. Them. Yeah, yeah, I know you. I know you're teasing. Chihuahuas are no, uh, I'm not. I just really love that. There's just something about like a four pound dog who's like fairly certain it can take on the whole world. You know, and I, 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 I meant that. you weren't teasing or picking on them earlier, but oh I, no, no, not a, never me. I would never tease a Chihuahua. It was was Grandpa Stinky Breath? Was he a Chihuahua or a Chihuahua mixer? You know, Grandpa Stinky Breath, and I'll tell you the story. He was, you know, he could have been maybe a Pomeranian mix or something. He was white. But just, just, you know, maybe 14, 15 pounds. But I was walking dogs at the Humane Society. And one night we were all getting ready to leave. And there was this little dog just barking and carrying on. And they're like, oh, Ginger, you're going to have to take him because nobody else could. He's just the noise. He had just come in that day. The noise here is horrible. So, you know, I fell for it. So I put him up in the bed with all the rest of the menagerie of animals and he crawls up right here and all night long he's going <sighs> I couldn't sleep his breath was horrible so I made him an appointment the next day with my vet I didn't even I bypassed the humane society on all that and um, he had to have his teeth cleaned every three to four months and really you know in the beginning my vet was like I don't know how long you're going to have him but let's keep his teeth clean and we were guessing he was about 12 and he lived another four years with the, after probably about a year and a half, I didn't have to clean his, have his teeth cleaned every three or four months. I think we did it one, uh, twice a year, you know, just like people yeah. do, but yeah, he was, he was something else, grandpa, um, stinky breath. Yeah. I love that. Well, you bring up a, like an actually super interesting point, which is that there are breeds that get worse periodontal disease than other breeds. And a lot of it actually correlates to size because dogs all have 42 teeth. So a great Pyrenees and a Chihuahua. And when you have that many teeth crowded into a tiny mouth, crowding is actually one of the hugest risk factors for periodontal disease. And then we think there's probably some genetic components to it too. So there's mostly little breeds, very,
very predisposed. There's also some big like greyhounds we know tend to get very severe periodontal disease. So there are some large breed dogs um, that fall in that. But yeah, if you have a little dog who has all of its teeth, like definitely march yourself straight down to the veterinarian and have them do a good oral exam. Well, maybe that's why chihuahuas are cranky all the time. They got too many teeth crammed in that Could little... Could be. <laughs> yeah, who knows? We, we definitely want to don't want to irritate the uh, chihuahua pet parents because they're just as crazy as their kids out there. I love them. Love um, it. How often, but but uh, so if you have a case like Ginger or one of the problematic uh, breeds that, that require more dental care and attention, um, uh, you know, how people's tendency is to give more to compensate so how many of these dental chews uh, per day do you recommend, daily do you recommend, and how many is too many? Because I imagine some people try to give them out as treats too. Yeah. So I would say they can be a great treat. You just have to be careful because just like most other treats, they really pack on the calories. So I would say for little dogs, you know, one a day is probably as much as you're going to do. If I, again, if you're still brushing every day, the treats are not necessary. Um, but if you can't brush, then they should have some sort of dental treat a day. Um, that's actually one of the places that I really like the dental diets. If you have a dog that can't have exclusively that diet because of whatever reason, um, using those as treats instead of things like milk bones or things like that can be good just to get something that's removing that soft plaque off of the teeth. Um, but we want to be doing something to the teeth every day. Um, you also mentioned, which is a perfect uh, segue to the next topic um, I want to talk about, is you spoke about something I'm fascinated about, and that is the dental diet. So let's talk about how important diet is and dental care and uh, a topic that's a particular interest to me, some, to me, some foods to avoid uh, because of their uh, carbohydrate con content. So let's talk about diet and dental care. <laughs> You know, the tricky thing about diet and dental care is a lot of the stuff that you hear actually isn't supported by any scientific evidence. So, for example, we hear a lot that, like, you really get a lot of benefit from eating just a dry food versus a canned food. That's actually not true. There isn't actually a really significant difference between just dry food and just canned food when it comes to plaque and calculus accumulation in our pets. Um, so dental diets, we know, do a really great job to get off soft plaque. Part of the reason, right, is that our dogs are not actually great at chewing their food. So I also have some dogs who kind of like suck the food down. It's like they're a food vacuum. And that's true for both dogs and cats. And so because they're not chewing kibble or chewing canned food, they're accumulating plaque and calculus. And so that's where the dental chews, the dental diets really come in handy. Um, and then carbohydrate count, interestingly enough, that also because carbohydrate, the thing that carbohydrates do in people that we really don't see as much in dogs and cats is predispose you to getting cavities. And that's because the high carbohydrate count, the bacteria that lives in human mouth can then feed off of that carbohydrate in those little pit and fissures that we have in our molars and make little cavities. Dogs actually do get cavities, but we don't think it's correlated to the carbohydrate count in their diet. Now, there hasn't been a lot of research done on that, so maybe that will turn out to be true, but so far it doesn't look like those things are correlated. That's fascinating. Um, so is the dental diet like a, a particular type of kibble or, or, or a food that you get? Yeah. Is, it some, is it a supplement to the dog's normal diet? So it's actually, it's up, there's uh, most of the big sort of big pet food companies, Hills, Purina, I think Royal Canin has one, have a, a prescription dental diet that you would have to get through a veterinarian. And they have a matrix that is designed to help reduce um, the unhealthy plaque in the mouth. And the kibble size tends to be a lot larger. So dogs and cats actually are forced to bite into the kibble to get that soft plaque off of their teeth. Um, but they have very special, I'm sure, carefully guarded secret um, recipes that help reduce that plaque and calculus. So at what point does a pet parent say, hey, it's time for my my uh, my, my puppy dog to go on the uh, um, the uh, uh, dental diet? Or is that something yeah. that, that their GP or, or somebody like you would that's the, that they would recommend it? Yeah. So I think I for breeds that we know are very predisposed to dental disease. So again, lots of small breeds. I think it's not a bad idea to just have them on a dental diet from the time that they're puppies. Because oh. again, 
prevention is worth a pound of cure for these dogs. So if we can prevent periodontal disease from getting bad, that's where we're going to do most good. So for my cat, I was just mentioning, we just got him last spring. He is on a dental diet. So what he eats as his dry food is a prescription dental diet so that I can try to prevent him from getting worse dental disease. Now, my dogs are both on special veterinary diets for other reasons, so they can't be on those anymore. Um, because of course, why would a veterinarian have a dog that eats something easy? Um, but <laughs> yes, I do. I mean, I think prevention for dental diets is really the the best way to go. Okay. Now, aren't there aren't there um, like dental diet treats? Yeah, so there are dental specific. So that the website that I was mentioning, the VOHC. So that is a group of board certified dentists who look through products and then test them. Um, actually, have like coordinated scientific studies on those to make sure that the treats are living up to the claims that they're making, essentially on their bag. And so those I would consider dental specific treats, um, okay. but they're not like the diet companies aren't necessarily making those. Okay. All right, uh, Dr. Horio, Horio, did we uh, miss anything about dental care, dental disease uh, in dogs? I just want to bring up one slightly controversial topic um, that wasn't on your list, and I'm sorry, I didn't get this to you ahead of time, but the, the importance that the dental care that we do for our patients is actually under anesthesia. So there are some places that you will see advertised have anesthesia-free dentistry, um, and I think they they prey a little bit on the fears that people have about anesthetizing their pet. And I, I will never minimalize those because I say it is always easier to be rational about everyone's pet, but my own. So when my own pet is going under anesthesia, I still feel nervous. But the problem with anesthesia-free dentistry in pets is that it we really miss the bar on the most important part of anesthetized dentistry, which is being able to get x-rays and really get in there and do a good oral exam on all the surfaces of the teeth. Because if your patient is awake and somebody is just scraping off the crowns, you're not actually looking for disease. You're just doing a cosmetic cleaning, which is not the same thing. Yeah, I uh, wish they just knocked me out when they cleaned mine. I know. <laughs> I know. I know. I know. I mean, I was like, mostly anesthesia is very safe. If you're doing these procedures regularly, they should be very short. They should be very routine. I mean, the patients that come to see me, they may need to have their, all their teeth taken out because we haven't done any preventative care with them. But man, if we could push dentistry into that preventative care realm, mm, I would love that. It would make me super happy. Yeah. I have a, a friend whose dog lost, had to have all of her teeth removed yeah. last yep. May. And she was really on it. And I would take care of her dog when she went out of town. And we were on the brushing the teeth. She had the food. She had the, you know, the stuff you put in the water, the yeah. dental chews. And it's, it, I guess it just happened. I don't know. Yeah. But anyway, I mean, she wound up losing all of her teeth. It is super hard, especially if it's a little dog because their dental yep. disease progresses so quickly and they often don't have signs that you can very easily see when they're awake. And so that's why I say, uh, especially for a breed that's predisposed, a good anesthetized oral exam with x-rays every year, so important. Is there... I try to bundle, if my dogs are going in for uh, a dental, let's say, and I found a lump or bump, I might just take that off at the same time yeah. if you, you know, if you have time. So I try to bundle. <laughs> yeah. For sure. So that, it, you know, I only have to anesthetize them once instead yeah. of twice, yeah. if I pos if I possibly can, you know, sometimes yeah. one surgery may take long and lot yeah. too long. And yeah, but, yeah we're I taking out all the teeth. We try just to have that be the one thing just because that's such a big oh, yeah. thing. But yeah, absolutely. We frequently will do a dental procedure and a little mass removal or yeah, something yeah. like that. And anesthesia is required for the annual dental care, correct? Absolutely, for sure. Must it is a must have. If the, if there isn't anesthesia, you're not really preventing disease. There's no point in doing it. Basically, there's no point in doing it. You you be better off, or just as just as better off, just as yeah. just good off. Absolutely, because I, I think the problem is like you get people get the the impression that they've done a lot of good because the crowns of the teeth are shiny, right? But we know that the crown, so the white shiny part of the tooth that you see in the mouth, that's like a third of the tooth. It's the tip of the iceberg. So the vast majority of the tooth structure is underneath in the bone and you cannot see that at all. So you may be busily cleaning off a crown of something that has a big giant abscess brewing in. Um, and so you just, you're not doing any good. I can't imagine attempting to clean a dog's teeth in any manner without yeah. them being anesthetized. Yeah. I mean, it really like I, the other part of it for me is that, you know, I'm, I am a fear-free 
you know, certified practitioner. And so we work very hard to have our patients not feel terrified. And, you know, nobody, no human, I don't think, except me, I love going to the dentist, but most humans don't love going to the dentist. And the dentist can explain to them, like, what's happening, what's doing. If you're holding a dog's down, putting super sharp instruments in their mouth, not to mention like we see dogs come in with horrific things done because of these sharp instruments in their mouths. But imagine how terrifying that would be. So yeah, not, I'm not a fan. I can't well, imagine any one of my dogs uh, yeah. that happening to. Yeah. And there then try be... to imagine a cat or a chihuahua. I can't even, oh, yeah. my, my, mine's nails. They were like, <laughs> oh, you're not, you're not doing that poppy. So, um, <laughs> well, let, let's try to do a little bit. Uh, let's, 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 let's take that and discuss it for a little bit to try to assuage and alleviate some of the stress and concern that pet parents have. Because as you mentioned before, it is a real thing. It is, it is even a real thing with me because I've had elderly Pyrenees and there's always that sort of, whether it's a myth or not, that the older dogs get, you really don't want to put them uh, under. So do you have uh, the the data, uh, Dr. Hoyer, uh, just a general data as, as how risky um, uh, or not risky um, uh, anesthesia is for dogs? And then uh, the, sec the second correlator question would be, uh, are there cases when just, just you, you don't want to anest uh, you don't want to anesthetize dogs and or there's a certain age or conditions that it's just not going to work out. Yeah. So I um, I have been a veterinarian for 20 years. And what I will say about the age is that for me, that does not exist. There is not an age beyond which I would not anesthetize a patient because here is a scenario that I sometimes see an owner or sometimes even a very well-meaning veterinarian says something like, oh, your pet is fill in the blank age. And usually it's like between 10 and 12 is too old. I don't want to anesthetize them again in the future. Now, the problem with that is sort of like, I'm sorry, was it Mr. or Captain Stinky Breath? I can't remember. So <laughs> like, like if Captain Mr. Stinky Breath had been told at 12 that he couldn't be anesthetized by the time he lived another four years, he would have been in terrible pain and discomfort because of how bad his dental disease was. And so taking a dog who's 10 or 12 and maybe still stable and doing really well, but just older and telling them not to anesthetize that dog and not do anything about the teeth, which we know are just going to get worse is a huge disservice um, to the dog because that is probably the healthiest that dog will ever be. And so to say, nope, here we are at this magic age, we've crossed this line. I don't recommend that at all. Now there are a very few medical conditions. And I think I have maybe in my 20 years, there have been like five dogs that I have said, yeah, your dog really is not possible. It is not possible to anesthetize your dog because they are so med medically fragile. And most of the time that has to do with very severe heart disease. Um, and so if there's a very big issue, we have, I mean, we see a lot of patients at CSU with profound heart disease because there's a ginormous cardiology service here. And even most of those we can safely anesthetize. Now, the difference is should that patient be anesthetized in a general practice? Maybe not. Should that patient at that point maybe be referred someplace where there's an anesthesiologist on staff who can support that patient and do sort of some of these sort of higher level monitoring and anesthesia support? Absolutely. Um, so some of our patients come to see us because of the level of their dental care. And some of the patients come to see us because maybe their dentistry issues aren't as severe, but they need the anesthesia support. Um, so I, I just would urge people to think about like, okay, maybe this isn't something I can do in my general practice, but maybe I can go someplace where they can do it safely with the right kind of support. Yeah. And I, I would imagine if the, your companion animal has any one of those uh, conditions, they're going to require specialty care. And that's, that's where right. you need to be anyway. Absolutely. Um, so it's you're obviously very passionate about that that myth then that age is not a preventative or or a prohibitive factor I guess in in administering anesthesia to um, your companion animal but it's just as equally I'm passionate about when when I hear people say that my dog is too big to have his limb amputated from bone cancer that's like my that drives me absolutely nuts because yeah. I hear it all the time. And yeah. I feel bad and I never confront anybody because sometimes it's a financial issue that they right. just want to, okay, that's, it's not the real reason, but I still hear, yeah. especially with country vets that, oh no, it's a, it's a Bernie's mountain dog. It's too big. Yeah. Can't, can't get around on three legs. I'm like, yeah. are you kidding me? Yeah. So At that, least give them the chance. Yeah. No, I think that it, for sure, it is a huge hot button issue for me because sometimes what will happen 
in my world, right, is that these dachshunds who are 12, and I'll, I'll pick on a different breed because I feel like I've, <laughs> so that's a dachshund who, dachshunds, if there was a breed that was a poster child for periodontal disease, that's a dachshund. They have these enormous teeth and these little tiny mouths and they're super stretched out. Um, so they get told maybe at 12 that they shouldn't anesthetize their dog anymore because it's too old. And then any self-respecting dachshund who, you know, is up to any good is bound to live till 16. And then by the time I see them, they're like 15 and a half. And then they really are very medically fragile. And we're looking at a very long anesthetic procedure. And sometimes like we truly see patients who have broken their jaws just because of dental disease. And that's something that we could have prevented if we had just done this procedure four years ago. Well, that's wonderful advice to all the pet parents out there that are listening to the show is that that's just, you, you need to get um, your dog um, into your vet, get the teeth clean, get them anesthetized, and especially the small breeds because the longer you delay that. And interestingly enough, you mentioned doxies. I thought about Thunder. Mark Buckland, he had a little doxy that was a lymphoma survivor. And I remember when he posted on uh, social media that uh, that Thunder had just lost his last two. So that's a real go. problem. There's a big problem with doxies then. It, we see a lot of dachshunds here. And so we then, love them. So we then, have it any other way. I'm sorry to interrupt, but so then at very, probably at a very early age, if you see pet parents that are adopting um, a, a doxy uh, puppy, then you probably just say, hey, let's get you on the dental diet from, from day one so that, sure. wow. That's, yeah, that's teach them to know. have their toothbrush, teach them to be on a dental diet, you know, habituate them to dental chews, like, and still have their teeth cleaned every year under anesthesia because they are those poster children, dachshunds, chihuahuas, schnauzers, like lots of the little breeds, like the earlier we can start prevention, the better. And dachshunds have bad teeth and bad backs. Yeah. Uh, I goodness sakes. Bless the hearts. I love them. But they live. I know, I've but they just keep on trucking. 16, that's right. They, they do. It's, it's, I have, they outlive all of us. Yeah. <laughs> I've had, um, I've had three and they live to be at least 17, sometimes oh, yeah. somewhere between 17 and 18. Yeah. They're like wheeling around in their little wheelchairs, like a little crusty, a little fragile, <laughs> but yeah, they're doing great. Definitely um, a little crusty. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so let's get to, well, I think we've done a, a pretty good job of, of discussing dental disease and care and, and, and dogs. Um, and thank you for bringing up the anesthesia point. Obviously, that's a very big issue. And I have heard more and more people talking about anesthesia-free dental care. And it's great that you framed it out. It's like, you might as well just not do it at all because yeah. it's not worth it. Brush their it's, teeth. Yeah, it's Didn't. really heartbreaking because people feel like they're doing something good, right? Because that's what we do every year. But then the problem is I see them when they're 10 and I still have to take out all their teeth because mm -hmm. they... They haven't done anything. The anesthesia free th hasn't done anything about the disease underneath the gums. So, all right, I, we did a great job covering dogs, our little puppy dogs. Let's get to cats now. So, to break down uh, for us, dental disease and care in cats, please. Yep. So the two big ones that we see in cats, still periodontal disease. We actually see periodontal disease in cats, just like we do in dogs. But then the other very common disease that we see in cats is something called tooth resorption, where cats, there's some sort of immune trigger that at some point in a lot of cats' lives, and we see it very commonly, their body just starts eating holes in their own teeth. And it's not like cavities. Um, it's progressive. You can't stop it. It's not related to carbohydrate consumption. It is just truly some sort of faulty switch in their immune system. So far, we have not been able to figure out how to turn that switch off. So that is, you know, people are just doing tons of research all the time about, is it too much vitamin D? Is it not enough vitamin D? Is it too much vitamin A? Is it the wrong kinds of proteins? It's actually something that we see in fossilized cat records. So this is truly just a cat thing. Mm -hmm. um, I just recently treated a tiger at the zoo that had it. So it, it wow. is not unique to our um, domestic cat populations. Um, I think we see it more in them probably because we look more, you know, most big giant cats are not getting anesthetized oral exams every year. Um, but the hard thing about that is once they have developed that, the only treatment we have for it is extraction. We have to take those teeth out because they're very painful um, and it will cause a lot of discomfort to the cat. So those are our two big ones. Now, periodontal disease, the way that we prevent it and deal with it is the same thing in cats as it is in dogs. Tricky part, right, is that many cats are not going to tolerate tooth brushing. <laughs> uh, so some are, you know, I have some owners who are like, I absolutely can brush my cat's teeth. I cannot brush my own cat's teeth. So I am never judgy if you cannot brush your cat's <laughs> teeth because I think cats are really good at holding a 
grudge for a very long time. And so sometimes you like try to brush their teeth once. And then every time you get out the toothbrush for all of time, they're just going to hide under the bed. And so then I do things like dental diets, dental treats, um, those kinds of things for cats. And then just the importance of an oral exam every year in a cat. Like I just can't highlight it enough because they, cats will hide their disease until it is very, very progressed. And so having somebody look in their mouth and do a good oral exam is critical. Um, so, so then you say in lieu of brushing then because of the, the sheer difficulty and some cats, not all cats will let you, some not cats, you know, let you do anything to them. They're crazy. Yeah. Um, so you recommend then that, that dental chews and those, uh, equivalent products, um, are, are, are just as, uh, are okay in lieu yeah, of Yeah, absolutely. Right? So I think, again, my own cat is on a dental diet because okay. I like, it was very clear, even at a very young age, that toothbrushing was not going to be in his future. So I was like, you know what, I want to have something that I'm doing every day. And for us, that's dental treats. He also gets dental treats. Um, CET makes a great cat treat. I think the hard thing about cats, right, is that some are very into eating many things and some are very into eating nothing, um, except like the one thing that they like. And so you know, with cats, I never recommend getting into sort of a, what I call a hunger strike fight, because a cat will truly like go on a hunger strike if you try to force your hand trying to get them to eat something they don't like. But if you can get a dental diet into your cat, I think it can be very beneficial. Excellent. Um, let's talk briefly. We still have some things to talk about, but obviously one of the big, uh, obviously, diseases um, from an oral um hygiene standpoint that that affects i think dogs more commonly than than cats is oral cancer um so let's talk briefly about the, the three different types of oral cancers that we find in dogs well so i'm going to back that up because you're probably thinking of malignant cancer so aggressive right. cancer My in the oral cavity right. no it's okay it's i think it's actually commonly misunderstood dogs actually the vast majority of the time if they have a mass if your dog has a growth in its mouth it's usually benign which is great news. Now that is not true with cats. If cats have a mass in their mouth, about 70% of the time the literature tells us it's aggressive, it's malignant. Uh, dogs much more likely to be benign. Now the aggressive tumors that we see, so the ones that are more likely to require very extensive therapy and then potentially could spread to other parts of their body. The most common ones are melanoma, um, which is actually a common kind of aggressive oral tumor in people. Squamous cell, squamous cell carcinoma, also very common in people, and then fibrosarcoma. Um, so those are the most common really aggressive type tumors. Okay. Um, what is the percentage uh, of tumors that you said that you say you said 70% in cats are benign? What percentage yeah. uh, are malignant in when you see a growth in your dog's mouth? What just give me some numbers. I'm a Yeah, I'm a so I would say in a dog, it's more like the opposite. So in a dog, 60% 60 to 70% of the masses that we see in dogs' mouths are benign. So it still needs to be removed. We don't want to ignore it but it's not gonna spread, probably isn't gonna require extremely extensive surgery. Um, we're just more like a tooth or a small area of the jawbone removed versus if we see a malignant mass, we're talking about a mandibulectomy or a maxillectomy, like big portions of the mouth. Um, so if you see a lump or bump in your uh, dog's mouth, uh, it's better than a coin flip that it's the malignant then. So you go yep. to check. Now, can they ask, can your veterinarian aspirate that or does it require? Oh. No, so it requires no. only require biopsies. Then. You want a biopsy. So one of the things that I tell my students when I'm talking about how to work up oral masses is, is never poke, only punch. Because a poke, which so the difference between an aspirate, for those people who don't know, aspirate is where you stick a little tiny needle in and you get some cells out. The hard thing about oral tumors is that they don't shed cells very well. So it can be very challenging. Most of the time you'll just get blood contamination because the mouth is so bloody. And you will have needed to sedate the pet to get that because most pets are not going to be tolerant of having a needles stuck in their mouth while they're awake, and then you're going to get a sample that's not diagnostic. It is much, much better to get an actual piece of the tissue of an oral tumor. Excellent. So what are the malignant tumors then in cats that we need to worry about? It's like the top three in that order are squamous cell carcinoma, squamous cell carcinoma, and squamous cell carcinoma. Wow. Like <laughs> more than 85% of the oral tumors in cats are squam. Yeah, which is pretty devastating because in dogs, if you can identify oral tumors easily, like today we did a rostral mandibulectomy on a dog that had a little tumor growing right here. So we just take off the little front part of his jaw, like that dog will survive probably another five years. It's only a seven-year-old dog. Cats, because they're so good at hiding, often we're not finding those tumors until they're very advanced. So the average expectance life expectancy post-diagnosis of squamous cell carcinoma in a cat is less than two months. 
Wow. Oh, wow. And in yeah. dogs, that's one of the better oral can malignant cancers to get. Is that correct? Um, it's certainly better than melanoma, which right. is sort of the worst one. I would say melanoma and fibrosarcoma are definitely the worst. Squamous cell carcinoma, I think it really, in my opinion, really depends on where they get it. So the farther back it is, um, the harder it is to remove a lot of tissue around it. So the farther forward it is, the better. Also, it depends on how big it is. So if it's so big that it's, for example, eaten up towards the globe or something like that, then we stand a much better chance of not being able to get out the whole tumor um, and then having it spread. Squamous cell carcinoma is also much less likely to metastasize than either fibrosarcoma or melanoma. What's the deciding uh, factor, Dr. Horrier, when you uh, have to make the decision to remove a uh, percentage of the of your patient's jaw? Uh, is it just because you can't get clean margins uh, just with the tissue alone? What's the deciding factor? The deciding factor is imaging, so CT. So when before when we are treating oral tumors in our patient, we like to start with a biopsy, so we get a little sample first, and then we do a full CT. So X-rays are great, but it's a two-dimensional image of a three-dimensional structure versus <laughs> CT, which is a three dimensional image of a three dimensional structure. So I can really see where those little tendrils of tumor are eating the way into the bone. And then on CT, I can measure how far around I need to go from those little tendrils of tumor to make sure that I'm getting the whole thing, if that's possible. So, but unfortunately, as you know, that not every vet, vet uh, not, not even every vet specialty yeah. clinic has a CT scan. Mm -hmm. So that's true. Uh, advanced diagnostics like that. So, um, would you say then that probably the best decision that a pet parent needs to make then is that once they get uh, the, the biopsy results back, that it is an oral malignant cancer of some sort, that they need to go find an institution that has a CT sc scan to figure out what the next step is? Is that, that, is that the yeah. correct step procedure? For sure. Yeah. I think a lot of the initial diagnostics, so the initial biopsy, x-rays, those can be done at your primary veterinarian. So if you see a lump in your dog's mouth um, and you can take it to your vet, they can take a little sample, send it into the lab. And then if it turns out it's benign, great. That may be all that we need to do. If it turns out that it's malignant, then I recommend going to a place that can do more advanced imaging and then present options for surgical, chemo, or radiation therapy if needed. Yeah, we always, I, I think on every episode, Ginger, I think we <laughs> always say go consult with a board certified veterinary oncology so you know all the tools in the toolbox that are available. Or a veterinary dentist. Or there veterinary yeah. de 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 <laughs> dentist in that case. Actually, I, I would imagine that that the, they probably need to go hand in hand, but there just aren't a lot of specialty clinics that have every one of those specialties in-house. It's true. And I think so sometimes, and you know, it like... Veterinary oncology and veterinary dentistry, sometimes, you know, we have a lot of overlap. The difference is that the only place I do surgery in the mouth, and so we get a lot of um, practices that refer in oral tumors to us. Obviously, the um, surgical oncology group does amazing things lots of other places, um, and I think it's the most ideal to have us both. It's just you're not going to find practices where both of those things are happening always. So one or the other is great, but definitely if you want options for how to treat, you need to go take that, get the initial diagnostics and then go do the next step. Um, what percentage of the oral malignant uh, cancers in dogs um, can be removed? Um, and then what percentage that require, require substitutive or, or follow-on treatment, either radiation or chemo? I think that's a great question. I would say you know, the of the patients that I see, the vast majority of them were able to achieve a, what's called a surgical cure. So get all of the um, the tumor tissue out of the oral cavity. Um, if that has sort of crossed tissue planes and is going from the mouth into the nose or from the mouth up into the eye, or like once it has gone into the lymph nodes and you're getting, then I think it's much more likely that they would need to um, then you know, seek out additional therapy besides the surgery. Um, but the most oral cancer, especially if you can find it early, which is, man, that is like the reason more than any other to get a really good oral exam done every year. If like, let's treat perio for sure, but most periodontal disease is not going to be the reason you have to euthanize your dog. If I can find oral cancer when it's small enough that I can actually fix it with a surgery, that should be our goal. Yeah, well, that's true of all cancers. The, yeah. the, I mean, the, the problem with dogs is that they have a different threshold of pain. And so they don't, they don't show the fact that they have bone cancer in some cases until the bone splits or, yeah. fragments or spongifies or something yeah. like that. So um, I think the difference in the oral cavity with that, though, is that most of the time we can see it if 
people are looking. So if you're, I mean, that's another actually great reason to brush your dog's teeth every day is that you are looking in your dog's mouth every day. And all of a sudden one day you're like, oh, what's this real little red spot? And maybe that little red spot gets a little bit bigger. And so, I mean, like we have owners who come in who have noticed oral cancers that are like two millimeters wide because they so frequently are doing work in their own pet's mouths that they're going to see it way before it's untreatable. Right. Um, Ginger, I just kind of had a thought. We have the early warning signs of cancer. and We're always talking about check for lumps and bumps. Do we have check the oral cavity? Make sure you check the oral cavity in there in that list, Ginger. On my, um, we hand out a little paper that has like a medical drawings of dogs. I don't have one with its mouth open, mm -hmm. but on the instructions on the back, it says to make sure that you're looking in, into your dog's mouth. And, yeah. you know, I'm like, and feeling around in there if they're not brushing their and brushing their yeah. teeth. But I will say I have a few dogs that are going to be scheduled for dentals real soon. <laughs> <laughs> this podcast has inspired me greatly. To I know. Be it, I tell you, it happens that. a lot. Like even when with our students, like they go through our rotation, <laughs> then all of a sudden they're coming in. They're like, oh, my gosh, I found this thing. Like what's happening? Yeah. The more you look, the more you find. Well, that's lots of wonderful, uh, informative data there, Dr. Hoyer, uh, about cancer and, and oral cancers. Um, you have, uh, I love, so you're at Colorado State University, and I love the fact that you're, you're a clinician, right? You see uh, patients, and, and, but yeah. you're, you're, you're also a teacher, but you're also a researcher, yeah. and we just can't get enough of researchers getting more and more data out there that we, so that we can make better medical decisions on behalf of of our fuzzy buds. So talk to uh, us about your research and your areas of interest. So I would say I am primarily a clinical faculty. So my research, I don't have, you know, like some faculty you'll talk to have like big research labs. Most of my research is done um, on clinical patients, meaning like we look at trends in like, hmm, how have these patients with this subset of oral cancer done? So we just studied a patient or a, uh, looked at a retrospective group of patients with a particular kind of oral tumor called plasma cytoma. And we're in the middle of a um, retrospective on a kind of cancer called oral epithelial trophic lymphoma, which is a special kind of lymphoma that we get in the mouth. Um, and our data is more just like, let's look at these trends. How how are we diagnosing it? What is it maybe showing up as that it doesn't look like cancer initially? And then how long are these patients surviving? Um, and then I do a fair amount of research actually in the exotics world. So we do a lot of work with zoos and things like that. So it doesn't necessarily um, translate to our fuzzy butts, but is important in these zoo collections for these patients who have um, really chronic underdiagnosed dental disease, just like a lot of them, to try to understand what options we have to treat those. And my my favorite area of interest actually in the oral cavity is actually developmental defects. So cleft palates um, and cleft lips and things like that and how to surgically repair those. I love developmental dentistry. I so. can honestly say I've met thousands of dogs on my travels having backpack as far and as long as I have and stay with as many pet parents. And I can't recall ever seeing a dog with the cleft palate. Ginger, oh, yeah. did you? You know, I think he had a cleft palate, but there was a dog back in 2013, 2014 that somebody rescued and his, his nose and mouth were really malformed and they named him Platy because he kind of, it made it kind of look like a platypus <laughs> and he had problems with eating and stuff, but that's where Luke, I got the cheese, the, the uh, canned cheese is that they would, he had to take medicine and it was really hard because of the shape of his mouth for them to like give him Kill the medicine. Him. Yeah. So how and common is that? So they put the uh, cheese in the, they put the medicine in this, I call it squirty cheese or the canned cheese, like yep. cheese whiz. And I bought, I bet I've bought cases and cases of that to put my, my dog's meds in. Yeah. Now, no, but that's uh, the only one. It? Yeah, it's, I mean, I, I would say we don't know because a lot of dogs who have clefts either die at birth or they're euthanized or mm -hmm. they just don't thrive, right? Because cleft palate so there's a big difference in dogs between cleft lips which is like the front which is you can see or dogs that actually have like their actual palate is not fused so they have a big hole at the roof of their mouth where the top of their mouth should be um, and cleft palate puppies require a tremendous amount of care to get them old enough to have surgery because they need to be at least about three to four months old and so they have to be tube fed they have to be tube fed every two hours they have to be fed special meatballs because they can just aspirate any food that they eat versus cleft lip puppies which can actually do pretty well i mean they look very different but they actually um 
they actually typically have pretty normal lives. Um, but I love the cleft palate puppies who tend to be very fragile. We see a lot of them in like the um, brachycephalic breeds. So like bulldogs, mm -hmm. um, boxers, things like that. I just love them. I love taking those puppies who are so fragile and fixing them and then letting them turn into amazing dogs who get to live their lives. So that's my, that's my pet favorite. Yeah, you also probably see some uh, dogs uh, post radiation. Um, if like I had a dog that came out to CSU, as a matter of fact, Dr. Uh, Withrow and Venable saw him. He had nasal adenocarcinoma and Venable was too advanced and uh, Venable wouldn't operate on it. So we chose uh, radiation. And that was my biggest concern was burning the, the palate, burning through the palate. Yeah, so we we actually were, are working on a project with the radiation oncology team looking at, because in humans, we know that osteonecrosis, which is actually a devastating side effect from radiation, is actually something that we see in our dog patients as well. So it's where your oral mucosa, which is the lining, um, dies off, and then you just have these big areas of exposed bone um, in the oral cavity, which is tremendously painful and carries a, a terrible prognosis. So we're working with our radiation oncology team on a study now to try to see if we can figure out, um, you know, what doses of radiation now that our radiation works so well, so our patients are living longer, we need to see if we can't figure out a way to prevent some of those really bad side effects and also look at what the predisposing causes are, because we know in people, periodontal disease is actually a really big one. Um, so we're trying to figure out if that's true in dogs as well. Yeah, and that actually, that actually was the decisioning decision factor that made me determine the slower uh, dose of radiation, IMRT, over four weeks is what we did initially on this nasal adenocarcinoma carcinoma versus the three days of massive dosing, I, uh, yeah. I, SRT. SRT, um, yeah. And that, to me, I think was one of the main decision factors was that I didn't want that massive dose to burn a hole and have all yeah. the complications as a result. Yep. Yeah. It's a, it's a big, it's a growing, you know, as we are doing a better job with science and we're doing a better job of the veterinary medicine, we're, you know, pushing the envelope on what we can treat and what we can see. Then we sometimes have to kind of pump the brakes a little bit and say, okay, now we're seeing this side effect maybe that we don't necessarily have a great way to treat when it develops. So what, where's that fine line that we can balance between making sure that we're getting our maximum survival times, but then also having those survival times equal a good quality of life. Well, I look forward to the results uh, from the work that you're doing with the oncology yeah. team, and you're welcome, you're most welcome to come back here and share the results with our audience. Dr. Hori, before we're running a little bit long, I knew we were, uh, we had an ambi ambitious- Too many ambi things. <laughs> agenda, but we're wrapping things up though. Uh, and, it, and so you're a teacher. So uh, aside from all the other things that you've, uh, all the other information that you provided us with, uh, what, are you, what are your main areas when you're focusing on pet parent education? What do you really focus on? For pet parent education, like the big thing that I talk to people about is looking in your patient's mouth so that you are an advocate for your pet. Because I think a lot of people are in the position of like the amount, you know, they'll look at their dog's skin, they'll lift an ear, they'll look at the feet, but they're, they don't feel comfortable looking in the mouth. And oh my gosh, I think that's so important. Like if you could get comfortable looking in your dog's mouth so that you can see those early signs of disease, so important. So that's the takeaway. I love that. Just that one simple takeaway. Uh, yeah. Brushing is a, is a luxury. The most important thing is look in the mouth. Look Catch the mouth. early. Pet parents are the first line of defense in oral Absolutely. cancer. Yeah, it doesn't matter. I can do the best job in the world my one day out of the year here. But if the other 364, no one's looking in the mouth, like we could get into trouble in a hurry. That's Sage Advice. Uh, this has just been a wonderful podcast, a ton of information uh, for me to take in and obviously change my practices uh, <laughs> now that you've uh, certainly painted um, a, 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 a certainly painted an image of the just the horrible consequences if you don't, if you neglect dental care in your companion animals. Dr. Hoyer, is there anything else that I've forgotten uh, or left out or any social media contact you want to give? Is there anything else that you want to say before we go? Nope, that's it. Just make ha, make a good relationship with your veterinarian. And if you feel like you want a second opinion, there is the AVDC website, which is the American Veterinary Dental College. There's a find a dentist link on there. You can look and see where there's a board certified dentist in your area. Um, you know, people are always welcome to email me pictures. We get tons of pictures and emails and things like that. So that is always a possibility. Um, but yeah, if you, if you have a dentist near by that you want a relationship with we're a bunch of good people there's a great last minute question then so what should pet parents when they're when they when they go to that find a dentist what should they look for when they're choosing a, a veterinary dentist well there's not very many of us so usually How it's many? just like there's less uh, i think we're now at like 220 in the world 
Wow. So we're, wow. we're a rare breed. <laughs> well, there, there are not a lot of many in the specialties in vet medicine because yeah. uh, veterinary oncologists, I think they're 500 or 600. Yeah. I don't so it's a, we're one of the smallest colleges. And so what I would say, it really, it really does most of the time have to do with like, this is the person who's near me. The good news is we're all great. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Well, okay. That's, it's wonderful. Dr. Hoyer, you're welcome back on a show anytime to discuss any research, any interesting things, new developments, more advice you want to give our, uh, our, the pet parents, our audience that listens to this show. Ginger, we've reached that time of the show. We're not going to do a puppy up foundation cancer tip of the week because we talked a lot about cancer. So, um, uh, before we wrap things up, did I miss anything? Did I screw up anything this episode? You think? I don't think so. No, but I you think always you did say well. that. You did well. Thank you. Well, Dr. Hoyer was was really the star of the show, and she was so informative and very passionate about uh, oral hygiene and your companion animals. So on that note, thank you to our audience. Uh, you could uh, check out and get uh, our new episodes for Fuzzy Butts and Friends drop a Tuesday. We're, we're, setting, uh, we're setting a clock now, so it should drop at midnight every Tuesday. You'll find it on your podcast platforms, such as Spotify, iHeart Radio, or you can go to our YouTube channel and watch this in action at uh, fuzzybuttstudios.com. That's our YouTube channel. You'll find in our video section all of our all of our episodes of Fuzzy Butts and Friends. Dr. Hoyer with Colorado State University, thank you so much for being on Fuzzy Butts and Friends this episode. And thank you, Ginger, for being a part, being the co-producer, and being a big part. Thank you to our audience. I thought you said I was executive producer before. <laughs> yeah, well, I heard that, too. We don't typically go back and ep edit our episodes, but I'm thinking I'm going to have to take that out for legal reasons. <laughs> All right, everybody. We'll see you next week. Puppy up. Talk soon.